Easter, the resurrection, is so easy for us to believe in. We've been there so many times before. We know the story. And indeed, all of the signs of new life, of resurrection, are around us. Flowers not only in church, but in our gardens. If you're lucky enough to have a woodland garden, you have the spring beauties, and the Dutchman's bridges, and other delightful things. And the birds are singing every morning, even if you get up when it's dark. The robins start their songs long before the first lights of day. It's so easy, isn't it? It was not easy for those who first visited the empty tomb. Just think of the context of the situation. Jesus, the mentor of this group of followers from Galilee, it's hard to know just how long they were following, but generally we think of three years of time because that's John's chronology. And they go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem the first time, according to the synoptic tradition. And Jesus stops three times on the journey and says to his followers, the twelve as well as other followers, you guys don't know what's going to happen, do you? But I'm going to be killed. And it was so shocking they couldn't comprehend it. The disciples kept talking about who's going to be first in the kingdom. Because they couldn't deal with the image that Jesus' vision, Jesus' mission was a different kind of mission. And so then they finally arrive in Jerusalem. And there's this glorious procession into Jerusalem, but it's not a big crowd. It's a small crowd because it's the group of followers that came from Galilee. But there's joy and jubilation, and they're cutting down branches from trees and singing Hosanna in the highest. That's on Sunday, the first day of the week. And then, if they were followers of Jesus, they saw him interacting with the religious authorities in the temple. And the threat of what Jesus had predicted begins to soak in. And finally, they come to the garden on Thursday night. And all of Jesus' close followers the male disciples, not the women, by the way, flee and leave him. It wasn't just Judas who betrayed Jesus. It was the whole group of twelve, as the Gospel of Mark makes clear. And then Jesus is crucified before their eyes. Now these people from Galilee may not have been as familiar with the crucifixion as a public execution because they happened more often in Jerusalem than they did in the hinterland. But they knew about it. And it's an awful thing to watch. And according to the Synoptic Gospels, it was only the women who watched. So that's the setting for this event on the first day of the week. It was grim. And we are only told of two people that got in Mark's account, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who go to the tomb. It doesn't even say why they went there. In the Gospel of Luke, it says they go to anoint him. But they go. And then they encounter a cosmic sort of reality. 
As they're walking to the tomb, according to Matthew's account, there is a great earthquake. Have any of you ever been through a great earthquake, you know, like in California or elsewhere? It's an awesome thing. It's a thing in which you're scared to your wits. Are you going to survive this thing? Now it's interesting that only Matthew recounts the earthquake. And it's not the first earthquake in Matthew. If you follow the Passion story on Palm Sunday, there's an earthquake at the death of Jesus. Now these two earthquakes are not recounted in geological history. Because this is Matthew's way of saying this is an event of cosmic proportions. You'd be scared if you encountered that. In fact, it says that the soldiers, the soldiers who were supposed to make sure that the disciples didn't come and whisk away the body, they fell down and they were like dead people. But the two women are there and they see this angel. What did the angel look like, by the way? How does it describe the angel? Like lightning. I don't know if any of you have been in a real lightning storm, close by lightning storm. You don't gaze at it. <laughs> and here is an angel like lightning, clothed whiter than snow. And the angel says, don't be afraid. And they're not afraid. The guards are afraid and dead, like dead people on the ground. And the two women go, and the angel says, do not be afraid. He's risen. He's going on ahead of you to Galilee. And as they leave, according to Matthew's account, they again encounter Jesus in his same words, do not be afraid. There was a lot that they could have been afraid of at that time. They watched Jesus be crucified. Who else was going to be caught in the net of Pilate's purging of people who wanted to threaten the regime? But let me tell you, we are in a time of great fear. And I don't care which side of the fence you are on, it's a time of great fear. There's the threat of the environment. The EPA may be defunded completely. There's the threat of people who are immigrants, who have been law-abiding citizens but might be whisked away. There's the threat of war, renewal of the Cold War between Russia and the United States. There's the threat of war in the Korean Peninsula, maybe even nuclear war. These are times to be afraid. And if you read the news regularly, and probably even more toxic if you follow the news on your devices, <laughs> what they call fake news, <laughs> it's scary times. And Jesus said then, and said now, do not be afraid. How can we not be afraid? The cosmic dimensions that Matthew lifts up is to say that God is doing this. God is raising Jesus from the dead. God who is the creator of the universe God who is beyond time and space. That is the God who is the source of the power of the resurrection. And it's on the basis of that that Peter, Peter who denied Jesus three times, Peter and the rest of the disciples fled <coughs> at the garden. Peter boldly 
Pentecost and now in this story of Cornelius boldly declares that God is the God not just of Jewish people. Do we have any Jews in the congregation? Any people from a Jewish background? They're all here because of Paul, of Peter. Peter declared to Cornelius that God was not just a God of the Hebrew people, but God was a God of all people, and that Jesus' salvation was salvation for all. That's the power that Matthew is trying to convey in his story. That's the power of the resurrection. It's a different thing about resurrection than watching flowers come up in the spring or listening to the birds sing. Wonderful as that is, because it's a power that transcends the very fears that we can easily walk in. <clears throat> so Jesus is risen. Let us rejoice. Amen. Amen.